Joining us now, David Bonson, the chief investment officer of the Bonson Group. David, welcome. Um, <laughs> I've been off for about 12 days and things are roughly where they were uh, the day before I left. So, I mean, I know there's been a lot of action since then, but what's the sense to make of this market? What should you do? Well, hopefully have a longer timeline than 12 days. That would that would help because you're right. Things are going to move around quite a bit. And over 12 days and sometimes over 12 weeks, we can expect what is effectively a flat line, even if there's a lot of volatility in between. Uh, you mentioned the Nasdaq being up 15 percent from its lows. And yet we know the math of it is how far down it still is from its highs. Uh, that a 15 percent recovery, if you were down 30, doesn't get you back half, not even <laughs> close. And that's that's kind of what uh, people are dealing with. It's the danger of being overly invested in excessively valued things is the recovery can be very, very difficult. It's tempting to look at where we were with the June lows and think that that was a bottom. Was it or is this a situation I mean, for a long time people were saying don't fight the Fed, don't fight the Fed. But now aren't we fighting the Fed in the markets right now? No, I don't think that we are because what people that uh, believe as I do that the Fed is going to capitulate, they're not fighting against what the Fed's doing. They're fighting against what the Fed is saying. They have a different opinion as to what the Fed will be saying in January or in March or whatever point at which the Fed breaks something, which hasn't happened yet. Uh, why would somebody think that? Why would someone not believe the Fed is credible here, that they're going to keep going and act like this Volcker-like hawkish machine for months and quarters to come? Because they haven't done it in 40 years. That's why no one believes it. Because of Greenspan and Bernanke and Yellen and Powell, there's a lot of history here that suggest once something breaks. Quantitative tightening has only been $47 billion a month. They're doubling that next month to $95 billion. Credit spreads have definitely widened, but they haven't broken yet. The credit markets are still functioning. I think people rightly believe that there's some point, I happen to think it'll be around 3.5%, at which point the Fed at least pauses. Maybe it doesn't start cutting right away, but starts to pause. I Why? hope that the Fed... Why is the Fed going to pause there, and what does breaking mean to you in this market, in this context? Let me start with why, pa why pausing. Because the Fed knows what they can't say that they have very little control over where inflation goes, that the bulk of this inflation has been supply side oriented, supply chain disruptions, massive demand resurgence out of a reopening from the COVID lockdowns. Most importantly, on the energy side, a total lack of preparation for needed U.S. production. The Fed can't control that. A Fed funds rate of 5 percent or 1 percent has nothing to do with getting more oil fields producing in Oklahoma. And so the Fed is limited, but they can't say it. They have to talk hawkishly, which I understand. But the market believes that the Fed at some point is not going to tolerate a real severe recession, growing unemployment, which just hasn't happened yet. So, so far, they're getting away with it. What do I mean by breaking something? Well, first, I guess if the unemployment rate were to shoot up above 5%, that's probably one element that would become more politically intolerable than inflation. But I think it's in financial markets. I just don't think the Fed is going to tolerate a freeze up of credit. I've never seen it. Uh, no one listening to this show has ever seen it. That when credit markets totally freeze up, the Fed says, nope, let's just keep on tightening. Uh, 2018 may have been extreme when Powell capitulated at pretty minuscule levels of credit tightening hmm. relative to what could happen. But that's what I'm basing my precedent on. So uh, when do we see the cards? When do, when do we get the river in this game? Is it January, you think, when, when we're able to tell, uh, are you reading the Fed and what they're going to do better than uh, what they're actually saying? Yeah, I think it, uh, in 2019, it was either January 3rd or January 5th. I can't remember, but it was that first week of January when all of a sudden all of that fear people had in the fourth quarter of 2018. Um, I remember having a dinner with Ben Bernanke where the talk was whether or not they were going to hike. Of course, he wasn't Fed chair anymore, but there was a conversation of are they going to hike four or five times more? And like two weeks later, they started cutting. I mean, that's kind of how severe that reversal was. That's not going to happen. I think what you'll see in the first quarter of next year is a pause. Hmm. And so you got 100 basis points to go, whether it's 50, 25, and 25 in the next three meetings or 50 and 50. I don't, I don't much care about the composition. They get another 100. Uh, and then at about 350, that's where I think they pause and we okay. start seeing the river, as you say, in Q1. <laughs> so about four months 
and a couple weeks on the clock then. How should investors position between now and then? Well, regardless of what the Fed is exactly doing for the next four months and into 23, I very much believe that the growth story is still overpriced, that the um, valuations on an absolute basis did never got attractive and on a relative basis certainly didn't. So I still would favor valuation and quality right now. This is just too easy of an escape for the expensive growth side of the market and NASDAQ oriented things. Uh, we are of course, are dividend growth investors at my firm. And so we really favor where you happen to not only have attractive valuation, but free cash flow. Mm -hmm. And so the free cash flow growth story speaks to higher quality, often speaks to lower valuation. That's the case right now in a lot of great names. And by the way, it's performed a lot better. The last segment, there's a lot of guys talking about the energy story. We love it. We totally believe dividend growing energy is a great place to be. All right. uh, and by the way, if inflation is not coming down on the energy side, it does well. If inflation does come down to the energy side, it should still do well, those midstream pipeline operators. Okay. David Bonson, thank you. Thanks so much.